Before we dive into today's insightful discussion, I want to share some updates that will enhance your FemPower Health experience. We're excited to launch our new interactive newsletter. This weekly newsletter is packed with the latest scientific findings, business insights, and essential updates in the realm of women's health. Signing up is easy. Just visit our website or click the link in the show notes. Our website is also a comprehensive resource organized by topic for your convenience. Whether you're delving into the latest research, exploring any trends in healthcare, or seeking information in specific health topics, it's all there at your fingertips. Additionally, for our Spotify users, we've created playlists categorized by these topics, offering you another way to stay informed and engaged. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, while we can't categorize content within the app, our website remains a central hub for all of these resources. And be sure to take advantage of these tools to stay on top of the evolving world of women's health, science, and business. Now let's get started with today's episode. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. Incentivizing people who run a healthcare business is you got to do more, right? You fee for service, you do more, you get paid more. And that underlies, I think, one of the fundamental issues with American healthcare is that it's not incentivized to think about preventing costly care. It's not incentivize necessarily to think about holistic care and all the different types of care you might need rather than a particular provider, what that provider is able to to do for you specifically. Welcome to FemPower Health. Georgie here. When I started this podcast a few years ago, it seems as though the awareness and discussions around the pelvic floor were minimal. Many of the challenges that women were facing with incontinence, prolapse, and other factors were normalized. But today, we have books, we have education materials, new products, and more. And it's really been great to see this evolution. But we still have another problem to address, which is the shortage of experts on the pelvic floor. So today, I bring to you Karen Stander of Hinge Health, and she is going to talk to us about the healthcare dynamics and how the impact of this shortage is creating challenges for those who are struggling, but she will also talk about what Hinge Health is doing to try to change that. Karen, it is so nice to meet you, and I'm really excited to connect with you because I've done so many episodes on the pelvic floor, and it's a really popular topic on the podcast. And what I also love is when people start creating technology to make things even more efficient and effective. And so that's really what we're here to talk about today. So why don't you first start by giving your background, and then we can dive into all things pelvic floor and how technology is enabling some of these women's health issues. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Delighted to be here. Um, So I'm currently the Vice President of Physical Therapy and Women's Health at Hinge Health. We are a digital health company focused on musculoskeletal health, helping people free themselves of chronic pain, acute pain in all parts of the body, including women's health, specifically pelvic health now. 
Um, my background is in, in public health. So I spent over 15 years in healthcare, being at the intersection of business and clinical care. So a lot of folks wanted to kind of go into this field um, as a clinician and, and, you know, realizing that they wanted to contribute um, in a business way. But I was really fortunate, I kind of found my calling early. I knew I wanted to be at this intersection and not be a clinician myself because I wanted to impact uh, systems of care, populations of care, and thinking really broadly about how do we improve access and outcomes in an innovative way. So most of my career before coming to Hinge Health about a year ago, I've spent in the traditional healthcare setting all across the entire spectrum. I've worked in um, the hospital side, um, in outpatient clinics with physicians. I spent three years in home care, and then I took some corporate roles thinking about clinical strategy across that care continuum. So I know kind of the brick and mortar ins and outs, all the all the good, the ugly, um, and I've um, I've led different types of programs across the spectrum as well, from oncology to neurological care, pain management. Um, so I've really kind of seen the scope of that, and, and and that's what kind of really got me excited to go into digital health, wanting to be able to again impact large groups of people beyond you know just the the walls of a and, and footprint geographically, and find really new innovative ways to deliver care, uh, particularly thinking about all the inequities that people of color face, that women face, wanting to uh, you know really develop solutions to to help people in, in, in all sorts of forms. So delighted to be here and kind of share a little bit with you what we're thinking about at Hinge Health. That's awesome. And you're speaking my language. So I don't know if you know, but by day, I'm a consultant for the healthcare industry. And I feel so fortunate because I really got so passionate about the startup world and how tech is really transforming healthcare, because I've been in the healthcare field, mostly working for biopharma companies for over 20 years. And now I do consulting for them. And, you know, our healthcare system is so antiquated and frustrating. And, you know, as a consultant, I look at how do we optimize? And what's so cool is technology is kind of forcing the industry to change, especially with these startups. And COVID, I think, is accelerating that. So this is really exciting. And I let's I, let's just dive in because I'm, I'm so excited to talk about this topic. So, you know, let's talk, you know, perspective on the data around, you know, pelvic pain and all of these women's health issues, because sometimes like we live in our own bodies. And so either we normalize it because it may be a gradual change or it gets normalized by someone external to us, um, or it can be an embarrassing thing to talk about. And so I always like to start with, you're not alone. Let's talk about the prevalence. So tell us about this spectrum of what you're seeing of how common these issues are and just that whole dynamic of pelvic floor. And I know Hinge Health focuses a bit more broadly on all musculoskeletal, but I know today we're going to focus on, on women's health. So let's let's talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So so one of those things, like you said, totally normalized. And, you know, we talk to our, our mothers or aunties or sisters, right? Like that happens to me too. You kind of can forget that common doesn't mean normal, right? You can have this very prevalent, but you shouldn't have to live with it and just be okay with pain or these symptoms. So one in four women over their lifetimes will develop some sort of pelvic floor disorder, right? That can range from incontinence pelvic plane, uh, pro- prolapse, a lot of these subjects that I know you've covered in your podcast. So very common, um, you know, can be t- very typical around certain life stages. So certainly pregnancy, postpartum, very traumatic to your body, right? And then as your hormones shift and um, over time, menopause and things like that can cause other changes as well as just your aging body. So can happen, you know, throughout a woman's lifetime. Um, incontinence is such a big one, right? One, almost nearly one out of two women. So kind of like a joke, like you're in a room, you look at another woman, is it you or is it me? Like one of us is going to have that issue, right? Uh, again, can occur like different times of your life. And then, and then even through, you know, something like pregnancy, 75% of women experience some sort of musculoskeletal pain. Um, so I'm about seven months postpartum with my second child right now. Both, both pregnancies experience lots of you know, actually different ones in each pregnancy types of pain. And then, you know, people forget to tell you, uh, they prepare you for labor, but the whole postpartum period, there's a whole host of issues there, yeah. um, you know, entire in, across your entire body. So, so again, going back to common is not normal. I think it's been easy as women for us to forget to take care of ourselves. Or when, again, you're talking to your girlfriends, your mom, your sister, like, oh, I experienced that too. It's just part of, part of having a baby, right? Part of, um, you know, part of aging, you know, you'll never be able to, to sneeze and not pee again. And, and, and I think 
that that part is is what we want to normalize and say yes normal yes great to talk about with your girlfriends and your sisters but let's get help too it's totally treatable and there are a lot of accessible and non-invasive ways to take care of yourself you know, as you're talking about this in high school, there was this very dear friend of mine and she would always joke about how her mom, when she would sneeze, she'd have to cross yeah. her legs. Yeah. And we all thought it was funny. Like none of us yeah. were like, oh, she should probably go to a doctor and get that fixed. It just was a, yeah. a funny joke that yeah. we told ourselves. So if you're having to cross your legs and you're joking every time you sneeze, let's let's do something about that. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's funny. Yesterday, like last night, my, my husband was telling him I was going to be on this podcast. He goes, I just saw a TikTok where a woman was crossing her knees as she, you know, she sneezed the same exact a- <laughs> example <laughs> because she didn't want to be. So it's now even on TikTok, right? It's something that's going into my husband's algorithm. So oh, I think God. we're getting to a place where it's much more normalized. Yeah. But I think the part that isn't quite there is the access to care. Right. And, and so I'm sure we'll, yeah. That yeah. Too. So, so let's talk about that. Cause again, you know, for those who want to know about specific pelvic floor issues, you know, I have experts talking about that and yeah. here we'll focus on some of the technology and how you guys support that. But I, I, I always, you know, it's funny. I, I'm curious if those listening to this episode are going to be women struggling who want to understand this, if it's going to be companies who want to better understand how you guys are operating or investors. So it would be interesting. I do hope women also listen to this because I think understanding the dynamics of the healthcare system just further empowers us, right? So talk to us about the dynamics of this healthcare system and the challenges with helping women. And, you know, and then we can get into like what Hinge Health is is starting to be able to do in, in the transforming that a bit and helping, you know, patients who are struggling with these musculoskeletal and in this case, women's health issues. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start start talking a little bit about just kind of baseline, you know, yeah. how the American healthcare system works, right? So primarily people get health insurance through their employer or through government funded programs like Medicare or Medicaid. Um, or they don't have health health insurance right now, and they had to you know buy it themselves off the exchange or these public markets. But primarily, most Americans will get it through their employers. Um, the way insurance work is again, majority of healthcare in in the United States is what's called fee for service, right? So every time something is done, whether it's a doctor's visit, a lab, a prescription, um, someone gets paid for that, right? So. If you kind of flip it from the healthcare delivery side, healthcare is a business, right? And even though a lot of healthcare um, systems or, or, or operators are not for profit, it doesn't mean no profit. <laughs> people get confused about that. They still got to pay the bills, pay the people, you know, pay taxes, etc. Um, so, so you know, if you think about just economically, what's fundamentally incentivizing people who run a healthcare business is you got to do more right? You fee for service, you do more, you get paid more. And that underlies, I think, one of the fundamental issues with American healthcare is that it's not incentivized to think about preventing costly care. It's not incentivized necessarily to think about holistic care and all the different types of care you might need rather than a particular provider, what that provider is able to, to do for you specifically, right? And so, so I think that's something that's really key that I think most people don't understand is, you know, again, it's not out of, I think, Malintin. I think, you know, medical care providers across America want to do the right thing, but it's the systems of care that, Agreed. you know, are, are creating these, I think, unintended consequences of, of doing more. So, you know, kind of, you know, an adage is, if you're a surgeon, you're going to want to cut, right? Because that's how you make your money. And you don't necessarily think about, well, what are all these 10 other steps we can do to necessarily help this patient who might benefit from physical therapy or um, maybe steroid injections or, you know, different things before going to this very invasive, costly surgery. So I think those are one of the, the issues with, with the American health healthcare system. I think the second thing is that it's very siloed, right? And uh, even though there are larger health care systems now that have integrated care, a lot of care in, in America is very siloed. So you have your doctor's office, which is its own shop, different than the lab down the street, different than you know the CVS pharmacy where you get your medications, may or may not have any affiliation with the hospital that you want to go to, or or you know the chiropractor. All these different parts of the healthcare system. Um, belong to different entities, belong to have different objectives, right? 
are getting are getting paid differently, may not be part of your network or not, and that has different implications for your cost. So, so a lot of ways that's not coordinated it well, and you can understand how as a patient that's difficult to navigate, difficult to know what your options are, and once you get care from all these disparate sources, how do they talk to us, right? And then that's kind of the, a third major problem is in this you know, day of digital, we have everything online now, you know, um, very f- few uh, practices, medical offices are just on paper. So everyone's on the computer, but there's information, but the information is not connected, right? And sometimes when their information is connected, it's not meaningful, it's not actionable, it's just a bunch of numbers and, you know, 20 pages of hard coded PDF. <laughs> How do you search a PDF, right? When you're in an emergency room, you need to make, make a decision right away. You want to quickly understand the history of that patient coming in. So we're in an age where there's a lot of information, but it might not be act- actionable or meaningful to the providers who are trying to coordinate and also to use a patient to figure out what do I do with all this and how can I utilize this to serve my healthcare goals. So practically speaking, you know, if I'm having like these women's health issues and let's be specific to what Hinge Health or even you can speak more broadly, you know, what are the impacts to let's break down general population and then let's talk about um, the underserved populations as well, because that's a a different dynamic um, that I wanted to speak about because I've been dying to better understand it because of some nuances of technology that they may not have access to. So for, from a general population perspective, what is what are the challenges people practically, on a practical level, excuse me, face? With women's health, you know, the, the latest stat that's going around, which is really unfortunate, because there's such an attention to, um, you know, lack of reproductive health around the country nowadays, right, is um, in half of the counties in the United States, they're um, there isn't a single OB- OBGYN. That's really alarming. There is right? not an OBGYN? Did I hear that yeah, correctly? Like a single OBGYN. Okay, there's Half one. Okay. Counties, yeah, wow. in, in, in America. So, and it's particularly in the South and the Midwest, right? So that's really scary, I think, as a woman or just someone who thinks about women's health more broadly, right? So is your average primary care in those counties where you don't have an OBGYN able to think through holistically all the needs of women, right? Um, and, and that primary care physician in particular is probably overloaded, right? If there aren't all these other providers. And I think it's a trend that we've been seeing, you know, decade after decade, especially with new grads coming out of medical school, they're tending now to concentrate in large urban areas, right? So really across America, the rural, uh, more geographically isolated areas that are they're getting you know less and less care. So if you're if you're women in, in in just those areas, if you can't even get to an OBGYN, like what are the chances that you're gonna you know have a provider who can you can talk to about all these changes that are happening to your body, and one in particular that really understands pelvic health. Even within the OBGYN and community, there can be lack of understanding of you know the referring to pelvic health uh, floor therapists, for example, when, when necessary. Again, you know, but kind of back to the way our systems are built, you know, after you have a baby, you have a one six month postpartum appointment and that, and that's it. It's the kind of like good luck. Right. And so I, I think a lot about women in, in those parts of America who just, you know, without an OBGYN and then, and even if they do have one, where do they get access? So, so I think holistically and, and across the broader of women's health population, those are the, the most issues is just having access to a provider who understands and, um, and, and, you know, are you able to see them enough to really get to the root of, you know, issues that you're experiencing. How is Hinge Health helping? And yeah, so let me tell you about what Hinge Health does and kind of our take on um, addressing these access and, and inequity issues for, for women in particular. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar, or your listeners aren't familiar, we are primarily an employer benefit. So um, employers from, you know, large Fortune 500 companies to actually small and mis- medium businesses across America, across industries. You know, we have uh, tech companies, we have manufacturing companies, we have teachers unions, you know, the whole breadth of all types of employers. Um, they buy us as an employer benefit, right? And they trust us because we deliver a return on investment. So um, members of that are our clients, the employer's population can sign up for Hinge Health. They fill out a questionnaire um, and we focus on, on musculoskeletal pain throughout the body, whether it's chronic in nature or more acute. 
for every part of the body, including, including women's pelvic health right now. And so to the employee of this company, um, we are access that doesn't require copay, right? Because their employer has already purchased us as a benefit for them. So to the, to the employee, we're 100% free. Um, it's convenient. Um, you can do this at your home. If you're traveling for work, on vacation, you know, everyone has their device with you. We offer a tablet. So that's how we address the, the tech issue, the lack of tech issue. We can offer a tablet um, that's connected over, over Wi-Fi for that. And we pair you with a holistic, a comprehensive care team. Um, we truly believe that addressing pain and musculoskeletal health as a whole, whole comes best from a coordinated care team. So that care team for us includes a health coach, um, physical therapist, and we also have a team of physicians, surgeons, nurses in the background who can all come together and figure out the best plan for that patient. So in women's pelvic health in particular, that is a pelvic floor physical therapist. And so I know you've had a number on, on your podcast, so they're specifically trained in, in this region. And we've kind of, I think, what's been really exciting about this program is we are really pushing the edge of innovation in terms of how to deliver pelvic floor care therapy virtually, right? Without internal examination, which most, a lot of women find invasive, frankly, yes. right? And, and, and there are so many barriers to getting care in person, right? I remember my own journey in trying to find a pelvic floor therapist and, you know, let's fast forward through all the access issues and kind of figure out outside. But like, once I got to one, there was only one of appointment available to me. Otherwise it was, okay, the next available booking is two months from now. And so I, you know, I was a couple months postpartum at that point. I'm like, oh my gosh, who's going to take care of my baby while I drive over to this appointment? And, and I'm on a pumping schedule. I was exclusively pumping with her. And, and how do I fit it in within this three hour window and come back and then pick up my, my, my toddler from daycare? So there's so many barriers in terms of transportation and, you know, getting to a pelvic floor therapist. So we try to eliminate that by, you know, basically having the PT in your pocket, we kind of call it, right? Like through, you know, the tablet or the phone, you can do that virtual appointment. It's convenient. It's kind of whenever you can squeeze into your, to your schedule. Um, the, the health coach really comes in, and I'm not sure if you're as familiar with the kind of a health coach or maybe some of your podcast listeners are, but health coaches are experts in behavioral change. Um, and when, why is that important when it comes to chronic care, uh, chronic pain, or just, you know, type of pain? We know that in healthcare, it's, you know, a big problem is just kind of getting to care and kind of figuring out what is the diagnosis treatment and, and what's the solution. It's a prescription, it's a form of therapy, whatever it is, but that adherence part is also really important. I think underestimated, we don't think about a lot, right? So our take is that we really believe that change comes when you actually integrate that behavior into your life. And for chronic pain, it's not just doing a couple exercises here and there and you're done, you call it a day. It needs repetition, right? That movement needs to be part of your life. You need to integrate it into a habit so that you have that long lasting um, impact on your chronic pain and you're continuing to strengthen over time. So that's why a health coach is so important to our model. It's not, you know, anyone can give you a list of exercises to do, right? To diagnose and treat and say, here, do this. But how do you actually do that over time is what's key and, and, and what's driven our clinical results. And so a health coach is specifically trained in understanding behavior chain, change, how to develop habits, to really work with people one-on-one, -on -one, understand their internal motivations, figure out what barriers there are to their life. And in particular, as we think about a diverse population, what are some of the different cultural beliefs or religious beliefs you might have that impact how you think about your body, your, your health care, so that you can integrate that movement and, and those exercises and what you need to do to keep yourself healthy. So it's really a holistic approach to, for us, musculoskeletal pain overall, but also in the specific lens of women's pelvic health, knowing that, you know, you know, half the problem is access and getting there. But once you get the diagnosis and treatment, here's the plan, you got to do it. Right. And so yep. we pair you with someone who's going to help you keep, keep accountable and figure out how does this work into my busy life and what's, what, what's going on so that I actually end up following through on this plan of care and I'm successful. How is it that the, the physical therapist or the physiotherapist are able to guide you from the pelvic floor perspective? Because in interviewing so many, like, for example, I interviewed um, Alison Shirkande twice, actually. In the last episode we did together, we compared these at-home pelvic floor devices. 
And one of the things that she was talking about is how you really need that internal exam to figure out the root cause of the pelvic floor issue. And so how, how does someone like get guided over the internet? Our philosophy is that a lot can be done virtually. And that's what I go back to. We're really trying to push the edge here in terms of innovation and care delivery. There is definitely a place for in-person exams and pelvic tr- floor trainers, right? To get that tactile, that feedback, but it's not, we don't believe it's necessary for a hundred percent of all women going through pelvic floor disorders or needing help, right? Got we it. think we can do a lot in having a very thorough whole body approach, um, which relies on a very solid kind of uh, objective and subjective examination by the pelvic floor therapist. And we've worked a lot with our pelvic floor therapists and our um, urogynecologists, you know, medical directors to really be thoughtful about how do we transition our, you know, what's traditionally done in in in-person care to the digital health setting. So it's not as simple as here's a webcam, you know, Georgie, like do what you did in clinic. It's um, we have been really thoughtful about every component of that. And thinking about pelvic health, it's not just the pelvic floor muscles, right? It's the abdominal, there's hip, there's lower back. And so there are a lot of things that the pelvic floor therapist can actually diagnose and understand and assess about the patient dur- through the, the virtual health um, setting. So we found that, um, you know, it, we've been able to co- accomplish quite a bit. Uh, our patients really enjoy the convenience, the access, um, the comfort of doing in their home. And, you know, a lot of women just don't want the internal exam. So we want to honor that and still be able to provide as much support as possible through our means. And there will always be a subpopulation, of course, that will need that extra step, right? And then we'll coordinate with a in-person um, provider to make sure that they get their care. I guess then there's two populations I'm thinking of, those who don't have a job and those who can't get tech access. Like, so is this right? I mean, today, because you're also a startup and as a startup, I know you have to focus on your minimum viable product, get that right, and then you can expand. So I totally get that. So maybe it's a vision rather than current state, but I'd love for you to talk about those who truly have limited access because you know, when I first started this podcast, we would talk about all these things and these technologies and all these really cool things and the subspecialists. And after a while, I'm like, in every episode, we need to talk about access to care because I feel like half the things we talk about, you need to have, you know, $400 per doctor visit cash to be able to cover the out of network doctor because the subspecialists usually don't take insurance and it just becomes this whole web. And I feel like sometimes when I talk about these topics, it's, oh, so listen to FemPower Health and I'll help solve your problem if you have a ton of money. Yeah. yeah, So maybe you could just address what you're seeing there and and just considerations, whether it's future state or or current. Yeah. Um, So you're right, Georgie. So currently, um, you know, our our main channel is through kind of employers, right? So if um, your employer doesn't offer hinge health or you, you, you know, don't work or have insurance through that, then obviously that's an issue. I think longer term, we would absolutely love to be a, a broader kind of mass market solution um, and to help people address pain. Um, fundamentally, when you shift things, and again, I've seen this in my career through managing kind of like, you know, brick and mortar care to now digital health, like there are a lot of efficiencies in transforming to the digital health setting, right? Like just basically like you're not paying for the building, the rent, you know, all of that. And so we can dramatically decrease the cost of care um, by offering it through a digital health sec- a setting. Uh, secondly, there's uh, such a maldistribution of providers, right? So pelvic floor, floor therapists, for example, um, you know, within 10 miles of San Francisco, I live just outside San Francisco, I could find probably easily 15 pelvic floor therapists, right? A couple of weeks ago, I was in Nebraska, where my husband's family from, and I'd have to go a hundred mile radius of Omaha, which is a big city actually, to get that same um, access to, you know, a dozen or, or so pelvic floor therapists. And that's not okay, right? Like those are, again, two, Omaha's a, a big city too. So through digital health, we can kind of aggregate the supply of these specialists who are across the country and offer them a means of delivering care in a more efficient way. And that helps at the end of the day, reduce the cost. Right now, you know, the cost is to, again, our clients are employers, but we hope that over time we can, you know, d- democratize that and offer that in a, a mass market solution. Secondly, I think um, the other piece 
outside of just getting care from a physical uh, pelvic floor therapist is the education component, right? And so I think there's a lot that we want to do as a company in providing education um, to the broader population, helping them, you know, at the very least for, for women's health, there's so much stigma and kind of just a lack of knowledge around that, illuminating that so that women can be advocates and, and access, um, you know, what they can for, you know, within their means. FemPower Health is pleased to partner with the upcoming FemTech and Consumer Innovation Summit. The summit is the latest deep dive event, part of the Women's Health Innovation Series, looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health, having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's health care by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. Okay. You know, what I'm also wondering is because of all the different aspects of the healthcare system that you worked in is how you're seeing a transformation and I guess I wouldn't even be able to pinpoint the transformation, but I guess what I'm getting at it, like which specific aspects, but I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, you started this conversation where doing more is how the system is set up to be incentivized, but we also know that costs so much more money than prevention. Yeah. Additionally, you know, this is something that's employer sponsored, not through healthcare insurance. And there's a ton of startups like I know Carrot was early on. They were kind of like the quote unquote insurance provider for infertility yeah. services. They were probably one of the first that I remember seeing that kind of moved into. And then obviously every single startup has gone to the employer benefits. So I've been watching the trends <laughs> and, and how everyone's been evolving. And so where do you see the impact on insurance companies and what they're starting to do, do you see people are finally getting that even though people are incentivized to do more in the long run, it actually hurts everyone? Like, where do you see things happening now? And what do you predict for the future? Yeah, so we are overall in the industry seeing a shift shift more towards value based care, right, which is this concept that um, you need to balance cost, quality, and ultimately the patient experience. And that can be done through a variety of ways when one concept is, you know, essentially paying for a bundle or paying for outcomes, right? You're getting paid for one outcome and however you decide to get to that outcome, right? Whether it's, you know, through preventive care, you know, less invasive care, et cetera, is, is ultimately kind of the decision on the provider. And that helps incentivize um, value for the patient and bring costs down. We're seeing health insurance and payers move towards that direction has been, you know, a long time coming and still very slow. Um, you know, what's accelerated is, you know, uh, you know, Medicare, right? Biggest payer government funding um, has introduced a lot of kind of experiments around value-based care. So that then has spurred providers, healthcare providers and payers to pay attention and say, oh gosh, we probably should do that too. And large employers also have a hand in this and, and kind of you know, thinking carefully about their costs and building their benefit policies, or if a, a large employer is self-funded, which, which means that they take all the risk themselves, they can construct their benefits in a way that incentivizes preventing care, preventive care by, for example, not having co-pays or co-insurance for your annual checkups or certain, you know, labs and, and, and things like that. So it's moving in that direction, um, probably like not as slow as as, as as we need to as an industry. Um, Hinge Health is also, I should say, um, partnering with health plans, right? So we are working with them to say, hey, include us in kind of, you know, the package of services that you cover because we, again, have a demonstrated clinical return on investment in terms of, you know, if your plan participants are doing our program and managing the chronic pain, then they're not ending up, you know, getting steroid injections, getting very costly um, invasive surgeries, which then leads to rehab and all these, you know, unfortunate outcomes. So I think, payers are more and more kind of recognizing these novel solutions that are enabled by technology and recognizing that you can deliver 
all this this type of preventive care and just kind of innovative care using um, sensors, computer vision, all the kind of tech, you know, the shiny tech parts that we offer, um, and and get those outcomes. Now, speaking of the tech part, is did I see correctly on the website that patients can put on devices so yeah. that we can double check that they're doing the exercises properly. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So we have kind of three cool pieces of tech that we are weaving into our, our programs and services. So one, as you mentioned, the sensors. So they offer real-time feedback. Let's say you're doing lunges, right? Um, so you can put those sensors on and in real time on the app, it'll tell you, no, you need to kind of um, bend more this way or move that way. So you know you're doing your exercises correctly. So that's kind of part one. The other part, which is, I think, super cool, is computer vision. So um, we're integrating computer vision, which is sensor-less. It's you know, looking into a camera, your tablet, computer, or phone, and that's it's sensing where your joints are, to, again, to add to that real, real-time real feedback. So in places you know, like pelvic health, where it's, um, you know, like, what are you going to do, put a sensor in your, <laughs> you know, you're not going to put a sensor there, right? Um, it's going to give you real-time feedback of how you're moving your abdomen um, and in different parts of your body. And the third piece of technology that we have, we have a um, FDA regulated device called Enzo. It's non-invasive um, electrical stimulation for, for pain relief. Um, so really cool. It's been helpful for women with endometriosis or really bad menstrual cramps. Um, and it's, you can, it's like a patch you put, you put it on, um, you know, very similar to a TENS unit if you've ever used. Yep. One My son uses a TENS unit. It helps for endo and period yeah. pain. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, so really cool. So we can assess if that's necessary for that particular patient and add it to the care that we're providing. So really cool ways of pairing. How do we think about movement? How do you, again, back to that adherence, right? You got the habit formation down, you're working with a health coach, but like, are you doing the exercises in real time? So similar to the feedback that you get in the in-person PT clinic, but again, at your home and in convenience and, and tailored to you. Okay. Now I'm curious if you've seen this from your perspective, because I know, especially as a startup, you really have to laser focus. One of the things I'm wondering is, do you see challenges with the consumer or even the healthcare provider and maybe even the payer struggling with so many? Because as these startups, you guys have to focus and get really good at what you're doing. So, you know, if you're the company that is, you know, storing sperm, if you're the company that's doing pelvic floor PT or like Maven, they're focusing on. So I could just see how being siloed, the now consumer or the payer, the company who's choosing benefits will now struggle in weaving through that. So I'm just curious if you've seen anything there, um, any challenges and and how people are overcoming it, or if it's just something that's the next phase of figuring out in our healthcare system. Yeah, that's a great point. I think, you know, over the last five, 10 years, there's been a plethora of companies entering just the, like you said, the employer benefit space, right? So what we're hearing from benefit leaders, from, you know, uh, health, health benefit consultants that we work with health plans is that, gosh, the space is getting really crowded, right? And we um, are less interested in number one solutions that, that aren't clinically valid, that aren't proving an ROI, because everyone can kind of like make up their stuff. But, but you know, when you have peer reviewed journal articles, when you're validated by third parties, right, that's what they're really interested in. Um, secondly, they don't want just kind of point solutions. And so that's why it's so important that our services are all under one program, one app, right? So you don't need a different service for your women's pelvic health. You don't need a different app or a different sensor for your acute pain or your your, your back pain, you know, versus this and that. Um, I, I think employers are looking to, you know, ultimately like kind of consolidate all the different, um, you know, vendors that they have. So it's kind of, I, that, I think that's the next wave. I would say secondarily, right now, it's been the past five years has been an especially frothy time for digital health in the musculoskeletal category alone, kind of quite crowded. And I think as capital markets are tightening, you know, in this, you know, whatever you call it, this recession, this like kind of tightening up of economy, a lot of um, you know, companies aren't just going to make it past that, you know, when they don't have true clinically validated solutions that integrate nicely into what the employer is already offering. So that's why it was so important for us to implement, we call it Hinge Connect, which is our integration with EMR. So, you know, in the beginning, I talked to you about the problem with data and having like a lot of information, but it's not actionable. We are integrating electronic medical record data from 
a number of providers across the country so that we can kind of figure out in real time, you know, does this patient also getting an MRI or this patient got prescribed opioids, we can intervene and connect with that care that they're getting so that we're not just a point solution that's living off on an island on its own. So, so tell us about the results. I mean, clearly you're going to have to demonstrate results to be able to have more employers want to leverage you and to be able to figure out how you all can improve your services. So I'd love to see, you know, the impact that you're having and even the feedback that you're getting from, you know, your audience. And it could be the employers, the, the employees. Uh, tell us what you're demonstrating. Yeah. So um, our women's public health program is, is pretty new. Um, it was developed through a lot of active feedback from our, our clients and even prospective clients and wanting more of a solution to address their diverse population of women, all the needs that they're serving. So it's since we announced, it's been ecstatic. We've had, you know, clients and partners say like, please sign me up first. When can I get early access? You know, like our women are craving this. And I feel like especially when the person in the conversation is a woman, you know, that benefit leader or whatever, like they're like, they, I always get a, you know, an email afterwards or call like Karen, like this happened to me too. And, and I wish I had this. Right. So I think we've found a lot of resonance with what we're trying to offer, because if you've been in those shoes as, you know, the woman who's trying to like cross her legs while she's, she's sneezing, you know, so she's not peeing or like the postpartum mom who, you know, can't get childcare for to see public health therapy, you get why this is needed. So we found that to be really ecstatic and we're still in the early days of this product rolling out across all our clients. But um, even internally, the, the clients that we have are like, raise my hand, I want to go first, right? And uh, over time, we, we, we will look forward to publishing, again, clinically validated uh, third-party verified results, just like the rest of our program. So, for example, we've seen our Medicare population, which is a population you think that is not as in tune with, you know, using technology. We, you know, still have uh, better outcomes than in-person therapy in using our program with a combination of, of health coaching. So so we think that, you know, we, we do have this the right recipe, right, and how we've thought about our program and all the components of coordinated care to deliver very um, similar outstanding results. That's awesome. And and it makes so much sense because, I mean, I have hypermobility disorder syndrome, whatever you want to call it. And I, I look back in my life and I'm like, I've been to PT a lot. And it, I finally had someone diagnose me. It was actually a girl I went to high school with. I was in San Francisco doing a consulting oh. gig and I made an appointment and I'm like, hold on a minute. I went to high school with her. So she was my doctor and she was unbelievably outstanding, like more thorough than anyone I've ever seen. But you're right. Then I just went off to PT. I just got a prescription go to PT and that was it. And so thank goodness I'm very obedient and I listened to instructions, but there wasn't like further follow-up and no one was triple checking. And, you know, I can totally see how Noom is the app, right? Am I thinking of the right name? Like they're using a lot of the be the cognitive behavioral therapy to make sure people are sticking to their plan. Yeah. So, you know, this is so, so great to see. I think one of the challenges we face is, you know, similar to what you said about being laser focused, there's so many problems to solve, right? And I think we get excited or clients get excited about the different paths we can have forward, right? Why don't you also do this? Oh, Hinge Health, we trust you with our, our, our client population in addressing their pain. Can you also do this? So it's easy to get distracted, um, but we want to do this really well and, um, and, and just be laser focused on um, addressing this mission. So, so right now for, for me, it's seeing us through with women's pelvic health, delivering the best program possible, having the strongest clinical results, the highest level of satisfaction. Um, I have no doubt that we will have other paths we can take as a company, but it's always the, the fear of missing out, right? Like this sounds sexy. This sounds fun. Our clients want us to do this. It's, we can go in a lot of different directions. So okay. I think it's a good problem to have. <laughs> That's awesome. So what would you want people to take away from this discussion. And I mean, I could see this being women who listen to this and say, oh my gosh, my employer seriously needs to do this. It could be, again, you know, lots of different folks listening. So I, what would you want people to take away from this conversation? I, I know you talk a lot about your podcast about each woman feeling empowered to make decisions for herself. And I think that's so crucial. I'd love to see us as women help empower each other and advocate and look out for each other. So when it comes to addressing these systematic issues in healthcare, right, and recognizing that a lot of women don't have access, a lot of women don't have awareness, how can we help other women get there when 
if we ourselves are in power. And so that could mean something like, you know, if you are in a position of power to influence the benefits of your company to, you know, get coverage for innovative solutions, right? Speak up. Or if you're, you know, um, not a position of power, right? A lot of companies have those annual benefit surveys and you're filling it out. These are our needs, right? Talk about that. Talk to your leaders about how this can really change lives. It really changes lives when when you don't have to worry about your, you know, your chronic pelvic pain, right? You're present, right? If you're um, an ad executive and you're scared to make that client meeting because you don't, you have incontinence, like that is time that goes back to the company, allows women to be more fully present in their lives. And so I think we can do so much if we advocate for each other and support these systems and allow women to get the care that they need. Well, I have had so much fun nerding out on the healthcare system and all the things we need to do to improve it. And it's great to see the impact digital health is making. And thank you all for focusing also and adding this uh, layer of women's health and the pelvic floor, because it is again, like people download these episodes like crazy. So it's clear that it's an issue. And I'm so glad you guys are working to solve it. So this was so fun. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Appreciate having me. Thank you for tuning into this discussion on the FemPower Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about FemPower Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support FemPower Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week. Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of FemPower Health. No matter where you are in your journey, our website is brimming with content tailored to your specific topic of interest or life stage. Dive in and discover the resources and insights waiting for you. Your voice matters to us. And if you found value in this episode, please take a moment to write a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover our podcast. By spreading the word, you're empowering women everywhere with the information they need to navigate their unique unique health journeys. And if this episode resonated with you, please don't keep it a secret. Share it with friends, loved ones, or anyone you believe would benefit from the information. Together, we can create a world where every woman feels supported, informed, and empowered. Remember, knowledge is power, and FemPower Health is here to guide you and support you in every step of the way. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for informational purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Until next time.